Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I won't go much into like detail of my, you, you have given a, a brilliant introduction, but so today um, I'll give the talk is structured in, sorry, in such a way that um, I'll try to give a broad overview of what we have been doing in this space. Um, and also uh, not from a, a kind of a very, uh, I mean, sorry, more from an exploratory and kind of a data-driven and top-down uh, viewpoint of understanding the different information feedback loops that uh, we might have and how can we leverage those information feedback loops in un better understanding the drivers and interventions for climate justice, environmental justice as the very broad uh, element. So, um, I mean, feel free to ask me a question at uh, any point that you would like. Um, and also just let me know if you are hearing me properly and then uh, that's, you can see the slides. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, this is the broad uh, kind of the framework that uh, we often use in our group to understand uh, different layers of how do we go into uh, the environmental justice and climate justice literature but using more data-driven approaches. And I think that's the whole uh, basis of computational social science. So there is uh, one is to deal with the theoretical settings of social science literature, but also try to get a sense of how different data-driven approaches can help understand those better. So this is not a kind of a replacement for the uh, causal mechanisms that have in social science and neither we try to claim causal roots. Sometimes you can find a lot of causal pattern, but again, you have to do more behavioral experiments to understand this. So the whole broad overarching uh, aim uh, of our group's work is like, how do we use different sorts of multimodal data that we say, and it can be surveys, it can be large big data from social media interactions, um, I mean, newspaper articles, anything that has a lot of social context into it, and then apply different interdisciplinary approaches in it. But then my uh, broad focus until now has been on these three broad dimensions. We call it 3R. So reduction of misinformation, skepticism, and trust, and how it affects the context of just transition. So again, I mean, this is, uh, I'm not going to give any answers to it because it's still an open question. But then the general idea is, uh, how do you facilitate understanding the different drivers in, in it? So uh, today, I'll, I'll, I mean, the talk is structured around four uh, empirical studies that we have done in recent, very recent past over, I mean, last year, and basically try to understand that how intersections of different forms of uh, theories and, and methods actually can help in understanding some of these uh, elements uh, from a, a top-down uh, viewpoint. So just just to give a quick background, uh, so I work a lot on this context of climate repair, and this is a very new paradigm in the climate justice and environmental justice literature. I mean, this is just, I think it's, it's just there in last three to four years. And What's interesting in this is that still people are trying to figure out what do you actually mean by climate repair? Is it negative emissions? Is it greenhouse gas removal? Is it carbon dioxide removal? So there are lots of different floating definitions, but it's it's still a very strong, uh, I mean, consensus. Uh, like there is no consensus for a definition. So there is this broad spectrum of what is known as uh, carbon dioxide removal that falls under the spectrum of climate repair, which is also in some ways are known as climate engineering, because the whole idea is that you intervene in earth systems using different approaches, and then you try to reduce uh, emissions, or you capture the carbon, like that's the main uh, core message in climate repairs context. So you can see here, there are different processes like ocean fertilization, which is basically how can you increase the iron concentration in ocean so that you can grow more phytoplanktons and those phytoplanktons capture carbon as they grow. So it's it's also known as kelp forest. So Cambridge has a center called Center for Climate Repair where they are experimenting with a lot of these 
approaches. So they do the engineering side of approach and I, I do the more computational and social science approach in that spectrum. The same is the enhanced weathering. So you break down big rocks into smaller parts and by that way increase surface area to capture carbon. The one that is quite common and well known is afforestation and reforestation. So basically you grow trees, uh, trees capture carbon and then you have like a carbon forest and then you trade carbon credits. But then all of this solution like direct air capture, which is you directly capture carbon. So one of the big challenge with this is these are very experimental. And for example, even with the most nature-based solution like afforestation and reforestation, the point is uh, you don't, we don't have enough space uh, to have that much of forest with the pressure of urbanization. And the moment you have forest somewhere very far from where your raw materials are needed, uh, like for example, wood products. So it's the whole question of then how am I am I mitigating the carbon? Because you will then transport through trucks or ships or whatever it's out there. So these are still very hard to kind of contextualize solutions. And therefore, as I mentioned that there are so many questions uh, around this carbon dioxide removal and uh, climate repair context. And one of the big ones are with the uncertainties of the solution itself and uh, the confusion in public domain. So that, that remains one of the big challenge, like how this actually is going to affect the biodiversity and our ecosystem at large. So we, we don't actually know that. So therefore, uh, in the greenhouse gas removal technology space, there are lots of uncertainties. And even within that space, there is something which is like uh, right out of the sci-fi movie, which is known as solar radiation management methods. So this is very controversial because the whole idea is that you reflect a part of sunlight by different ways. And within that, you achieve a localized reduction in temperature. So in theory, people have observed that whenever there is a huge volcanic eruption, um, the sulfur particles in air tend to make the localized area cool, cooler in a way, but I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's not actually yet feasible to have it at scale. Uh, so lots of experiment around, especially the third point, which is the stratospheric aerosol uh, interventions or SAI. So injection, basically. So what the idea is that you have these specialized flights which fly at stratosphere, they spray uh, sulfur particles with this, the same idea of mimicking uh, volcanic uh, eruption. I mean, the after effects of volcanic eruption. So it's extremely costly at the moment. People are still trying to replicate some of the effects in a lab, but I mean, the deployment is a big challenge. Not only that, the bigger concern is how it's going to affect our atmosphere and environment. And does it in, improve or decrease the air quality and everything else connected with it? The same, uh, in the same way, there are like my colleagues at Caltech, they are experimenting with space-based methods. So that's again, a very sci-fi kind of a thing where the idea is that you uh, reflect a lot of sunlight by placing specific solar mirrors uh, I mean, uh, mirrors in space. Again, I mean, it's it's still very theoretical and, and people are thinking. The ones that are taking a lot of uh, traction is actually increased uh, marine cloud brightening, which is that you artificially generate clouds, which reflects a lot of sunlight and the surface albedo. So that, that means that you like, one idea is that can you place mirrors in desert and then it reflects a lot of sunlight and then there is a lot of uh, geophysical element to it. But then the social science questions here are, all of these are uncertain and no one knows what's, I mean, there are estimates of extremely high financial investments, but no one knows the return, whether it's like actually going to reduce any effects of global warming or not. So that's the bigger question, policy question. And, and that leads to a lot of, kind of uh, oppositions that you could see here. It's it's like people say it's a Pandora's boss, box. There are lots of oppositions in the context of social justice, climate justice, and environmental justice, and especially coming a lot from indigenous groups, because uh, I mean, it, it's still, I, no one knows what's the mechanisms and it's not communicated well yet. So, I mean, there is this broad global movement from UNFCC uh, and IPCC that, 
you can't deploy solar geoengineering or any of these, uh, like especially the solar radiation management tech by 2030, you still have to do a lot of uh, research and especially putting them in public domain. So that, that's something is one of the kind of the motivation of our work that we are doing in this space. So the first one, uh, as I mentioned, was actually looking at that how people or a subset of people actually interact with different uh, climate technologies and is there any embeddings that we can figure out from it. So the first, I mean, literature, which is very survey based for this moment, they, take, they say that people have very little to no idea about this tech. And, and that's one of the ways why there is a lot of polarization and misinformation on this topic. And, and that's something to work about. And, and even IPCC says that all of these things should be more in public domain. So improve public understanding or improve public engagement on this topic. Um, same with like, then there are lots of studies which are based on simulations, but then they are based on simulation of long-term like 2100, 20, like uh, 20, even 2060 or something like that, where they, have in simulation, they show that there are certain effects, desirable effects rather, but then in the near term, no one talks about what's going to happen in the near term. And, and that's where this whole information feedback loops become very important to understand um, kind of what's the, how uh, the consensus are driven or is there any specific direction where these things are pushing forward. So we looked at close to uh, 2 million tweets because that was uh, quite a very dynamic platform to study various interaction on these topics. I mean, it's not the perfect platform uh, and also it, it is just a subset of public opinion, but still as a uh, data set and uh, it's, it's very interesting to study that. And then we looked at all the types of uh, climate technologies that's out there. So it's not just SRM, but rather anything that falls under it. And then try to see that how topic kind of move over time, uh, especially from 2009 to 2021, and which are the more topic of interest. So in figure C, it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, even within the solar radiation management space, a lot of uh, development have occurred around stratospheric aerosol injection. And, and that probably is related with that a lot of Silicon Valley startups are very interested in investing in this form of climate engineering startup. So that's again, uh, quite a concern in the public domain that you have a lot of, uh, I mean, uncertainty plus a lot of investment coming in. And same with uh, A, the figure A that you can see that still a lot of uh, emphasis is on carbon capture and storage. So that's the overall broad overarching topic that is still that is very interesting to a lot of, uh, I mean, stakeholders basically who are in, in these platforms. And it can be public, it can be investors, it can be academics, it can be, I mean, industry uh, groups. But then CCS is, is a very uh, uh, topical term to uh, see now. And also you could see uh, the strange, I mean, not a strange, but a very interesting pattern that from 2012 to almost 20, 2019. So between that time frame, geoengineering, which is a form of, uh, I mean, intervening in earth system, they became a huge topic of interest. And then, I mean, it's it shrank a lot in 2021 because of overarching by CCS. But then this is again, a very interesting trend to see. So, I mean, these are more uh, technical detail about what's the characteristic of tweets, retweets, because that help us understand the network dynamics in this space. And then th that's where this whole idea of computational social science become interesting, because now we have a very interesting data set and we can't simply use computer science approaches there. So there needs to be uh, some sort of theoretical basis for it. And then that's where CSS becomes very important. So here we have used a pre-trained large language models to kind of capture uh, the sentiments and emotions uh, as a classifier. And then we did lots of sensitivity analysis. So th these pre-trained models are by Google and Meta and we had access to them. So basically the idea with uh, this classification, so that's where the theory becomes quite important to understand that which technologies are more susceptible to certain specific emotions or like public attitudes. And, and that's where you need the kind of the 
subject specific knowledge as well rather than just doing uh, data science experiments on it so this is like the super interesting uh, finding that we have so in that 2 million uh, tweets so you could see the yellow bars uh, that anything that has to do with atmosphere is highly related to conspiracy theories and i think that's where it's the whole main messaging that comes in that um, with all the other uh, technologies they are slightly embedded more in public understanding or in public domain but anything with atmosphere is feels like the main uh, if you go back to the tweets and look at the main kind of narrative or the rhetoric that's embedded there, it all talks about someone is trying to take away our freedom because they are trying to capture uh, atmosphere or anything that's above us, like uh, the sky. So th that's the whole main core idea that why they are so highly likely to be uh, related to conspiracy theories. And that's a kind of a susceptibility thing that's out there. But also... You could see in the sentiment in the negative space, uh, ocean fertilization has a lot more negative elements. So again, it's the whole idea that someone is trying to capture the natural resources or nature that we have and kind of uh, sell it towards us. So you, the whole idea with anyway the climate deniers is is that the climate change is not a big problem, but some groups are specifically trying to make it a big problem so that they can sell the solution. Uh, to us. And I think that's the whole messaging also that goes into all of these space. But then the more green bars that you could see uh, in the bar charts, basically. So anything that's afforestation, that has ecosystem in it, that has this interaction between human and nature are, are seemed positive, which is also, I mean, not surprising in a way, because that's the messaging that has been there for a longer time. So when you project those, uh, all the tweets, so each dot here are a tweet. And this is known as TSNE projection. So basically you reduce the dimension of millions of tweets into a 2D plane. So in this 2D plane, you can see that, so the, this is like a very good way of studying the overlap, like who dominates the conversation in some way. So the blue, you can see the blue dots, they are everywhere. And these blue dots is the whole geoengineering uh, element. That, that That's why a lot of these technologies still have a lot of polarization and misinformation on it because there is this interconnection. But some of them are quite separate, like afforestation, uh, GGR, anything in general, CCS. So you could see like there are certain echo chambers that are kind of uh, immune to uh, the blue dots. And, and so again, I mean, as you can see, this is very uh, kind of exploratory way of understanding these interactions. Uh, so, so again, I mean, this is more uh, technical. So next, what we did was we tried to get into these networks and uh, try to model the network in such a way to understand the uh, interactions of various uh, elements into it, especially to deal with geoengineering, because that's the overarching uh, kind of uh, topic that, that drives a lot of the other conversation in this space. So that goes into un, uh, modeling spillover. So I mean, lots of literature, especially in economics and political science, they talk about spillovers. And the spillover basically means interconnections between or like some idea that spillover or like rhetoric narratives that spillover between two places. And so we try to kind of model that using more network science and, and then also leveraging a lot of uh, natural language processing because I mean, we already had the uh, one study that kind of showed in an exploratory way. So taking this forward, so that's why we thought that geoengineering is one of the key drivers of such conversation even now on Twitter. So if you even, if you are using Twitter and search hashtag geoengineering, you will just come across so many of these things now. And now it's even more harder because now it's video. So you need multimodal approaches. So for us, it was like more in terms of setting up a natural language processing pipeline, using that, using different forms of sentiment analysis. So here again, I mean, the approach is like, you can't always use large language models that for example, drives chat GPT to understand a lot of these tweets because like th these tweets are just 300 character at max and they are not enough to extract the context from it. So a lot of different approaches. So there are one called VEDAR analysis, which is so VEDAR is also a very good way of understanding it. But then the question was, is it just a one-time thing or does it does it work as a moving average? So that's the whole idea of uh, seeing these 
patterns as a moving average. So they are moving with time. There is a time series element. So again, I mean, that was the open question. Next was a very interesting uh, deep learning approach that we got across Google. And then they told us like, they are developing something called perspective API. So that is used a lot by uh, like journalists or someone who are active in public interface or public communication. And this uh, deep learning model actually kind of helps in classifying toxicity in uh, opinions, in like comments, in tweets, et cetera, whatever it's out there. And, and, and that was something that we also used here. So there to go deeper into those networks, the first was to track the funding. So how are these projects? Because still, as I mentioned that these are not actually deployed. So all geoengineering projects are still like scientific research projects by different partners and mostly situated in global north. So how different uh, funding bodies, which are large national funding bodies have funded different projects in, in, in global north, especially in US and UK, uh, they are kind of the drivers of these topics. And uh, so you can see that over time, the one that drives the most of engagement even now is something called Scopex. So Scopex was actually a planned pilot experiment that was tested to launch in Sweden, uh, I mean, governed by Harvard University. But then this is also one of the examples of how public uh, opinion can shape the outcome of such uh, projects. So this project was had to be canceled uh, because of high rise in public uh, protests, especially in Sweden, because that's where the indigenous groups thought they were not um, justifiably consulted and they were not, uh, the permissions were not taken properly. And the whole idea that someone is trying to capture their sky and take the freedom away was one of the main reason behind it. So you could see like, even when moving average, which is the second plot, uh, the peaks of negative and neutral uh, are quite high. Uh, and these are like six months moving average plot. So it means that these are not instantaneous, but even after six months and even now, uh, they are still have a lot of opinion. It shapes a lot of opinion dynamics about like whether geoengineering is a positive or negative, whatever. And same with the third plot, which is basically the absolute shift in polarity of the uh, messaging that's out there. So you could see like a big dip uh, around 2017 here. So a core element that drives a lot of conversation here is this uh, conspiracy, which is known as scheme trials. And, and this is, again, has its basis in the early days of environmental justice. But then it, take, it took a shape around that every time a, a aeroplane or a jet flies and it has contrails, so the water vapor or water cond condensation. So it's a conspiracy that uh, believers think that it's a way that people are trying to spray poison and uh, kind of capture uh, or control them or, or make them sick, whatever that's out there. Uh, but then that's the whole messaging that someone is trying to spray poison in the sky. And, and that's the whole uh, geoengineering experiment that's out there. So this conspiracy actually drives a lot of network. So as I mentioned, so we wanted to go deeper into those. Uh, so this is like the way it's called word embeddings. So embeddings are the same technology that when you write in Google search, the next word is predicted. So this is the prediction of what's the... Uh, next word associated with chemtrails and how it changed over time. So, so that's basically like from 2019 to 2021. I mean, what I find quite interesting, apart from the like lot of talk about justice and like it's it's like a weather altering experiment in 2013 to the one in 2018. So it gets connected with like anti-vax, COVID, and everything that's out there. Like a lot of group they believe that it's a it's something by Bill Gates is funding and it's called Bill Gates project dimming the sun. So like here you could see like it has a very high probability of uh, appearing closer to chemtrails. So again, I mean, these are very probabilistic uh, kind of indicators of like how the whole uh, context is shaping up over time. And then people also connect it with like climate propaganda, microwave warfare. So basically the idea is that uh, it's that I mean people are trying to create a fake climate change through this 
So that's the whole point of climate propaganda. And then microwave warfare is again, I mean, it's it's very militarized in a way. So I mean, now so that that's one context that we know. The other context was okay, let's move around, move up the conspiracy and misinformation uh, filter out the chemtrails. So is there any indication of genuine concern that we might find in the embedding? So that, that's where it gets interesting to see that a lot of uh, kind of genuine concern are around like what happens to the biodiversity, what happens to the nature, what happens to our global mitigation efforts. So a lot of uncertainties and scientific discourse talk about that. So uh, you apply some of these climate engineering thing, uh, will you move away from your promised mitigation pathways? I think that's the bigger concern that some country will say that, oh, I have the technology. I don't want to invest in uh, moving away from coal or moving away from uh, fossil fuel because I can offset that using this technology. I think those are still the genuine concern that a lot of people um, talk about that what happens to mitigation or is it mitigation plus uh, geoengineering. So that's uh, more likely to happen because, I mean, everyone is going forward with these technologies, uh, but then that, that's the whole uh, tension in, in this space. So the spillover effect is basically like trying to map the house, why a person who is uh, sitting in, let's say, kind of uh, US or UK, they will use a hashtag India or they will use a hashtag Sweden in, in these tweets, which are very specifically trying to convince people that solar geoengineering is a conspiracy theory and people are trying to take away our freedom. So that's the whole spillover thing that we try to measure. So, I mean, there is a metric called eigenvector centrality, which means that how certain words or for us is the hashtags, how certain hashtags are central to the conversation and they drive a lot more traction or they drive a lot of social network uh, movement. So using that metric, so here the size of the hashtag corresponds to the value of eigenvector centrality. So, I mean, you can see in figure A that chemtrails obviously is one of the core messaging element that people use hashtag as a connecting uh, tool on, on this platform. So they are the biggest one, but also like there are certain clusters that develop. So the green one in UK is more concerned with the science element of it that I mean, people say that there is no scientific evidence or there are not enough evidence and we need to do more science. Whereas the blue ones uh, are pure conspiracy driven. And then that's where you can find Brexit and some of these other geopolitical elements going in. Same with Sweden, because I mean, one limitation of these tools are we couldn't do the Swedish tweets because we didn't use any multilingual uh, models. But so even with the English, it was very specific that anyone who uses hashtag Sweden was kind of based in US and they were driving a lot of conversation around like what Harvard is trying to do uh, and change the entire atmosphere. Bill Gates is funding it, billionaires are doing it and a lot of these deep state, Trump and a lot of the political uh, misinformation as well. Uh, I mean, as you can expect, the US is so populated by these uh, conspiracies that it was very hard for us to create uh, specific uh, like clusters around that, even the network. So everything is kind of overlapped and then they have their own uh, smaller uh, uh, kind of echo chambers there. So one that was quite caught my eye in US was like this, there is a chemtrail, which we know is a conspiracy, but also there is op chemtrail, uh, which is also driving the conversation. So both of them have different connotations. One is trying to, assume that chemtrail is already happening. So opposite, we don't want that. The other one is trying to create a more kind of a information ecosystem around that chemtrail is real and be aware of it. So th that's again like the uh, kind of a very reactive uh, effects that we find in, in these networks. And the India case was very interesting because it was like uh, the chemtrail was actually getting connected more with digital India and like the India, Pakistan, China, a lot of geopolitical uh, elements over there. And I mean, which was also quite expected because one, again, for India, a lot of uh, non-multilingual use. Uh, so we just use the English available language tweets. But also I think that's where the interconnection was since it was very global north driven. A lot of interconnection actually intersected with the localized uh, elements in this space. 
So I mean, not going further because of lack of time. So uh, again, I mean, the it is just the same kind of uh, interpretation of that networks into a more cleaner form. But then here it's like the what are the highest centrality scores that we might find. And again, a lot of these are overlap with uh, political and kind of anti-vax, COVID uh, conspiracies as well. So that's the whole literature like tells that yeah, conspiracy tend to grow by connecting with like-minded conspiracies and then it goes and shape a broader narrative around this topic. Uh, so, I mean, Time Magazine uh, covered this literature and then I, I, I mean, our paper, and then I quite like the kind of the headline that they make. So it, this still remains one of the core messaging that there is a bit of truth that some groups are trying to control our natural resources, but we kind of don't, I mean, but that does not make them right. Like, and that's why the whole polarization and misinformation kind of angle that goes into it. So, I mean, not um, like one of the things that is quite important for climate governance in general is that, uh, until now, the policy space has always think, I'll always thought that they are quite immune to some of these elements. But now, with more digitalization and opinions being transmitted very fast, then also there is a reaction to that opinion. So that whole paradigm is taking a shift, and and kind of that's how, where we need to be more aware of the digitalization that's happening at a larger scale. And the other part is also like, does it affect the consensus? Uh, for climate action. So we, we don't know the answer yet. And I, I think that still remains an open question and, and kind of trying to work through it. So moving slightly to a different part, which is like more hard to decarbonize sector. So, I mean, this is a very interesting one because the whole idea was that uh, how do uh, policies have traveled in hard to decarbonize sector. And one of the such sector is like the building sector because it's really hard and it contributes to almost 39% of global emissions. So, yeah, I see a raised hand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So before going to this, so I have like few very interesting study. I have few clarifying questions. Like you have used eigenvector centrality. I mean, first is that is the question of power when we actually use some of these things like power in a sense how we understand who is saying what because the word itself like the conspiracy or spillover and all this has some power dynamics who is saying this is conspiracy so that's a very important thing to understand so yeah. uh, it's not like we are labeling opinion a opinion b opinion c and then comparing different opinion which is kind of a value neutral when we are using conspiracy word itself and hmm. searching with this thing. So it, the value neutrality, it is we are taking some side, which is okay. But uh, uh, that's a, that's a, like a maybe longer discussion. But I'm just curious to know like why you have used eigenvector centrality. Um, that's the thing, not the other centrality measures. Uh, so I think one is definitely driven by literature. So a lot of literature actually talks about using eigenvector centrality, especially when dealing with uh, instrument like hashtags and in specific social network like this. Uh, so I think that's the first reason. And the because, second one- uh, It is interesting to know the bridges. So, I mean, I'm just thinking about, I don't know whether it's possible or applicable, like Bart's constraint. So uh, Bart is like less use thing, but uh, that gives an understanding between the two different clusters and the linking between things. like. Who is the important player to know? I can mm. picture we know that that person is connected to a powerful person. Maybe they do not have like degree centrality is very high, but their mm. identity centrality high. That's why they are powerful and their voices were actually they are into the entire network. So that's one important thing. And do you have any uh, kind of a descriptive statistics of this? Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean not here, but I have in the uh, okay. papers. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing, like in, in these studies, uh, without descriptive statistics and actually placing the tweets, so we have a table of actual tweets with the values, just to make a contextualization that what's happening. And yeah, I mean, that we and always- also the get... clusters, like how many yeah. triangles or like any K core, I mean, try to understand, mm -hmm. is it very sparse or yeah. like- Exactly. Density or something like that. Just yeah, yeah, absolutely. We, we have all of those. Yeah, I, I, I just haven't shown it here. No, no, no problem. Just yeah. 
So, I mean, same with the next study is also very same, but it's it's a it's a very slightly different context of like hard to decarbonize sectors. So again, uh, taking a very reactive route to it and trying to understand, like especially because all these COP events, like they place a lot of emphasis on uh, kind of the building sector. And one of the hardest thing is the world is urbanizing, uh, I mean, very fast, while some areas in global north, especially in European cities, they are now trying to go in some ways to carbon neutral, but that's a very long uh, way to go there. Uh, but for our for us in global south, a lot of urbanization uh, means that a lot of emissions and and kind of the carbon is being added to the built environment, and and th that's a very interesting in itself a very policy I mean question that how do you go away with it because one that everyone says that oh you reduce the embodied like carbon emissions in buildings. So embodied means anything where the carbon is attached to the materials that are being used to make the buildings. But then the problem is you can't import wood, which is a more carbon friendly, low carbon material from Europe and build in India or Indian woods. Uh, I mean, there is not enough to actually build. So you have to defo deforest, like yeah, deforestation will be at scale. So I think the, those are still uh, very challenging tasks here. But then what was interesting was, uh, I mean, not it, it's very similar method, was to actually look at uh, different forms of high level policy events around uh, building decarbonization that happened since 2009, because that was the one of the first time uh, in COP15 that they actually thought, oh yeah, building sector is very important because I mean, there is no gold standard for it. And that leads to something that we see as lead standard building or like uh, there are different standards to it. And then is there any specific effect or like any specific, uh, again, I mean, these are observational in its way. You, There is, I mean, I can't say that, uh, I mean, there is a correlation to it, but also it does not actually mean that people really like EU Green Deal, therefore they are, more positive to whatever is happening in that sector. Uh, but then we do see certain patterns like whenever there are bigger and more powerful policy body making a claim on hard to decarbonize sector, for example, IPCC released the global warming 1.5 degree report. Uh, there is a huge spike in uh, anything that has to do with emissions and buildings. Same with EU Green Deal, because they ultimately they are certain instruments, they shape a lot of funding mechanisms in these areas. And, and similarly, like the one that happened in UK in uh, 2021 was this COP26. So they had an actual very specific uh, pavilion on net zero. And we, we did a lot of work on uh, that net zero context. And the whole idea was that how do you bring in more financial mechanisms in this space? And can we have any uh, kind of reactive understanding that what drives a lot of this conversation. And again, I mean, just going slightly back is around 2014, the IPCC AR5, they had a very specific chapter on building sector uh, emissions as well. So yeah, I mean, again, it's the same uh, point. Uh, there are more statistics definitely on density edges and uh, nodes, but then uh, obviously it's quite obvious that over time these get more traction and then they develop over, uh, like the networks get bigger. It's a scale-free network. So one also one point on that is uh, whenever there were IPCC that connects directly to a sector, especially this kind of sector, uh, there is a lot of uh, traction to it. And then you could see here, like, yeah, I mean, I'm showing the table here of actually which were the kind of the a lot of driving uh, tweets, uh, basically. So like, for example, in more recent times in N4, in N4 network, which is just for 2021, you could see one of a very interesting one was climate change is natural. We only make 5% of CO2. We produce gigatons of aerosol offsetting our CO2 emissions. So, I mean, that's where something that's got embedded in the context of why IPCC uh, wants to change our entire building codes and guidelines or change the entire, how the entire industry works. So that, that was something, I mean, these are just graphs, but then that was something we wanted to look at. And then going back into, so this is again, 
like one of the theoretical instrument that we have used here it's called discourse um, i mean it's tweet discourse theory so that kind of emerged from scholars who work on climate accountability in uh, sweden and those scholars they produced a very nice kind of a framework of understanding that if you have certain um, words in in the context like they uh, mapped environmental justice labels with a lot of other things in, in different climate contexts. Again, I mean, this is not perfect in any way, but it, it's a one way to understand um, that whether certain words or certain topics moved over time. And if so, then what are those? So you could see like until the IPCC AR5 was released around 2013 to 2014, because it takes a, like almost a year to release those. Um, the whole black bars are the ones where you won't find any mention of any uh, like the air pollution, carbon tax, affordable housing, healthy building, social housing, which are very environmental slash social justice uh, topics uh, in, in those conversations. But over time, uh, when there are more engagement, especially from a very high level policymaking body, and then it, it creates some sort of mechanisms like financial mechanism or policy uh, mechanism that gives indexing or gives them certain uh, advantages to enforce those. So there are lots of, um, like the bright colors are something that shows that they are quite central in, in driving that whole uh, element. So one thing that was quite uh, evident here was that until, like even now, but then until 2012, the industry was something that was very, like especially the building and construction industry was very central to all of these. And they did not want to change the kind of business as usual that you would anyway, uh, I mean, it's not surprising. But also with the introduction of that, you have to in enforce low carbon building codes. You have to enforce low carbon uh, certain policies across the spectrum. So again, uh, those things like there is a slight shift in it. So again, I mean, uh, you we did not or we could not measure with this uh, network, but definitely that's something worth saying. Yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, is this uh, analysis based on specific country? No, no, this is uh, like, uh, there is no country. It's, it's just the entire, uh, like, uh, whatever Twitter gave us in the entire uh, okay. cross section. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So, and, and I mean, this is the last. I know I'm slightly running out of time. Uh, so, this is uh, more in understanding from a very, uh, like, leveraging political science literature on how reframing behavior occurs and more specifically trying to understand is there a triangulated uh, element between how fossil industry shapes and reframe or reframe the online uh, narratives around climate and sustainability so uh, the answer that everyone knows is yes so we actually framed it i mean again it's a very interesting story from a publication point of view we framed it directly as fossil industry does greenwashing. And then the reviewers were like, well, there is no scientific evidence of greenwashing. So you can't say that. And they rejected the paper. So th then we kind of went and tried to understand that why greenwashing is uh, like, what is the underlying mechanisms of greenwashing? So that's where we kind of uh, stumbled upon a lot of literature on political reframing. And then that's where uh, this whole our idea came that we ca can we measure reframing in some way. So this involves all the uh, top fossil industry. And then our criteria was anything that has more than kind of like uh, 20,000 uh, followers, except the Peabody because they were quite new on the platform. And so they, these are the global accounts of this firm. And because they have a lot more reach. Like for example, the total followers in, in that, if you just do a social network analysis that we, that is close to 1.6 million in total, but now it's even more. So the idea was that how, is there any triangulated um, interaction between industry who are held accountable for climate change or emissions uh, in most, in many cases. The second is the ones who oppose them through policy. So that is the IGOs 
intergovernmental organization or through more grounded action, which is the non-governmental organization. And again, the choice of these firms, especially in NGOs and IGOs, were just by the follower base. So anyone who has more than 30,000 uh, followers in their global accounts. So this this is a again I mean it's it's a very interesting analytical framework that we had because I mean one is that you have to do NLP that's fine but then how do you measure triangulation so that's that's where we took inspiration from macroeconomics so in macroeconomic if we treat these tweets and the engagement as time series uh, data set so that's where you could do a lot more with. Uh, vector autoregression because that kind of gives you an idea about the uh, whether there is a push and pull between certain topics or between certain themes. So that's exactly what we try to do here. So, I mean, this is just a representation. And then we also try to look at whether there is a effect of any exogenous variables like stock market and extreme weather influence. So, I mean, there is a literature who shows a weak correlation with some of these social media interactions between stock and also climate change. But again, I mean, these are very, uh, yeah, we did not find any strong evidence of it and which is also quite aligning with the literature. So why time series? Because you could see here, all of these are some sort of time series while there are certain breakpoints, but also when the when we look at specific topics, like when renewable becomes a topic of interest. So that's where you need, like we did this, what is known as JST, which is known as Joint Sentiment Topic Modeling. So it embeds, ex uh, it extracts the key topics that are quite repetitive and then embeds specific sentiment framing to it. And uh, th that's where these are. So we came across 30 such topics, which, which were very repetitive. And then it has its own uh, methodological validation and robustness check procedure, which I'm not showing. Uh, but definitely, they do have some time series characteristics, which is quite interesting to see. And then that's why we kind of formulated three hypotheses to test in a way that stakeholder with more ability to direct conversation uh, will direct the topic in their do domain of expertise. So that's basically trying to test whether uh, fossil industry have a more holding on climate and sustainability topic just because they are in conversation or with IGOs and NGOs in place. And, and that's exactly the second uh, element, where, whether they are more successful at redirecting. I mean, because that's something is directly related with greenwashing. But we, I mean, again, this is one step uh, before anything that happens in the greenwashing space and the exogenous tests. So this is uh, the overall kind of uh, like, so we ex extracted 20, 30 such topics which are very relevant in this space. And you could see in the x-axis, uh, sorry, on the y-axis on the other side, is that the negative, neutral, and positive sentiment embeddings. So I mean, what is more important is just look at the lighter colors, because that's what is like different groups are very concerned about, and they kind of repeat a lot uh, in, in the uh, data corpus, uh, basically. And so like one of the things that very popular in fossil industry space is air pollution. And the second is media engagement. And I mean, there are certain elements of like a lot of PR activities that goes on, which is also quite understandable because like we looked at the global accounts and then they are very specifically PR machines of this firm. So when looking at the VAR, which is the vector autoregression, so one of the mechanisms uh, be, be like that drives VAR is known as impulse response function. So it means that if you give a shock of one standard deviation to certain uh, variable, what is the response to it? So all these dots that you see, so dots are the actual coefficients and the lines are the error bars around it. So we see that industry's influence of NGO is very, uh, I mean, it's, it's not pronounced apart from places when there are topics that are associated with IPCC, climate action, protect biodiversity, and, and like praising corporate sustainability, promoting a uh, company website, etc. That's all there. And same with whenever NGO kind of influences the industry. So again, I mean, and, and sorry, just one note is, so these are all significant uh, coefficient. So we removed all those that are non-significant. So therefore, you would see a very less interaction effects 
in it. So an NGO kind of influences a lot of the terms around whenever there is like industry support STEM. So that's where they also turn on their kind of the whole messaging machinery that this is something you are trying to avoid from the main use of divestment and, and some of these topics. And IGO is very specific that you would also expect that on climate action, renewables, anything that has to do with a lot more policy instrument and action. So like stop Excel pipeline is something that very much kind of triggered by IGO's interactions uh, with the industry. And so for stock, as I mentioned, like there is no industry specific influence uh, on, I mean, the idea is that we already know that Twitter engagement is kind of very weakly related with anything to do with stock, but still we checked just to see whether the, some of these topics actually influence some of them, but they are very weak. So you could see that they are extremely close to zero in most of the cases. And then for a uh, specific um, extreme weather event. So again, I mean, why this four? Because like, that's what I could get the data on in a public domain. Um, so like, for example, in drought, there is very less influence. Uh, I mean, these things are kind of very weak in, in general. So only the hypothesis one kind of makes a statement that there are certain topics which kind of triggers the mechanisms of communication or reframing from the industry. Other topics are very weak, or at least the data that we had that showed these are quite weak uh, in this space. So yeah, I mean, all of these are experimental that you could see. Uh, we are not trying to prove any causal relationship or just kind of scratching the surface from a very data-driven point of view. One challenge that I often face is this is a very uh, niche and growing to like theme. So reviewers have their own understanding. Like some understands it's from a very sociological point of view. So everything that I said kind of make no sense and they will uh, reject it. Uh, some are very data driven, so they look for more robustness and by that you reframe the entire uh, study. So I mean, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing uh, experiment with how do we kind of place the messaging very well. And I mean, just one uh, learning that we had is that uh, aim for the topmost journal because some sometimes they understand the niche element of it. So therefore we kind of like try to aim for nature and nature portfolios in a way, because even if it's rejected, uh, uh, they, they give good uh, suggestions on what to do or what's the main uh, negative point in such study design. So yeah, that's it from me. 